And I thought it was just a really interesting um, service to talk about. It'd be interesting to see who's looked at it before and who's heard about it. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's start with, so I'm Richard Weirasinger. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. Uh, I'm in the enterprise team, which means I work with the larger customers. Um, my background, I've been working with AWS for two years, roughly. Uh, my background is actually mainly financial services in the UK. So we're talking banking mainly, uh, Barclays, uh, HSBC, Credit Suisse, uh, so banking in, U in the UK. I also worked a year in NAB in Australia, so mostly financial services. Um, since, I, since I came here, um, I've been working with AWS and working with enterprise customers. And by the way, an SA is a solution architect for AWS. It's about evangelizing the AWS products and services and helping it, the customers, in my case, my segment of enterprise customers, adopt new, new services. Um, okay, so. So what's the, oops, let's try that again. Okay, what's the agenda? So I'll just talk a little bit about next-gen DevOps and what that is and how that fits into the AWS um, developer landscape, the services that we offer. Then we'll dive a bit deeper into the Amazon DevOps Guru service itself. We'll look at some customer references. Uh, most of those are not in New Zealand, and so my challenge is let's find somewhere in New Zealand that can pick up the service and go for it. I think it'll be very cool. Uh, a little bit about the free trial because AWS does that a lot. You get a bit of a free trial before we slap you with the bill and uh, keep charging you for the rest of the time. And then we just talk a little bit, if, if anyone wants to, uh, maybe we can have it over a beer later, is, is this the beginning of the end of IT jobs and you know, is it, is it, is it going to be the rise of the machine? Right? Okay, so AWS has got six main categories for uh, sort of developer services. The first one is CICD, and if you're not familiar with those, that's like uh, AWS, uh, sorry, it's AWS code commit, code build, and code pipeline, and code start, all the things start with code. And those are, those are the kind of services that are really designed around helping the developer using managed services to deliver software in all the meditation. And so, hopefully you've come across them, if not, Worth a look. Uh, infrastructure as code, we've got things like CloudFormation and CDK. Um, SDKs and CLIs, there's lots of language support, so if you probably find something you're happy with even if you're exotic. But if you, you know, all the common languages are supported and more and more languages get supported all the time, so it's probably something for you in this SDK and CLI space. Uh, IDEs, AWS has their own cloud based ID called Cloud and I. But we do also offer integration packs that allow you to integrate with your most common IDEs like VS Code or IntelliJ, so and lots of others actually. So you probably find something again that suits most developers. Uh, there's plenty of tools in the application modernization space, and this is really to bring your legacy applications to, to AWS or to bring them to the cloud. It's, it's uh, tools like database migration tools and sort of legacy uh, Windows workload management kind of stuff. Nothing too exciting, but it helps you get there. And then the last category is this next generation DevOps category, which is one of the services we're talking about today. And this category here is basically where AWS is using, it's, it's AI ops, where the services are machine learning powered. And this means machine learning powered is an important term because it means you don't need to be a machine learning specialist to use the service. It just means the service is using machine learning to, to, to uh, as the engine underneath. Um, so before we get on, right? Who who's heard of Code Guru or DevOps Guru? Anyone? I mean, I know that Gitgo is he's he's a little Code bit the case. Code Guru, yes. Okay, so interesting, and there, there's a reason why I talked about DevOps Guru versus Code Guru. We'll get onto that in a second. Um, so. Let me tell you a little bit about where those new services fit in the developer lifecycle. Right? So, so this is meant to draw a diagram of what typically happens in a application development lifecycle. Developers come along, they write some code, there's usually some sort of automated pipeline in most modern organizations that are doing 
application development. There's some sort of automated pipeline. And so they commit code to source. Um, they run some build tasks, automated, hopefully. Uh, then if everything passes and all the builds work, it deploys the test. And then if, if your test environment, you do all your testing and you make sure everything works, hopefully automated, but maybe manual. And then if it works and you're great, you promote it to production. So simplified, but this is pretty common. Uh, hopefully that's not unusual. So the first next-gen DevOps services were created for developers, right? So they're called Code Guru Re Reviewer and Code Guru Profile. So the, the first one, Code Guru Reviewer, can be thought of as a virtual code reviewer. That's it. So normally you check your code in, you raise a pull request or something, and someone with some sort of a, a more advanced developer normally, or someone with some who's an SME in that area, will look at your code and critique it and say, no, this is not good, you haven't thought of this, please fix this. So Code Guru Reviewer is an automated one of those that basically is um, integrated with the build stage and will automatically review your code as you're checking it in. So this will do things like check for, uh, well, it's not really doing syntax checking, it's doing deeper than that. It's doing what a code reviewer would normally do. And then what it does is it provides recommendations to the developer without having to go through a manual process of someone expensive having to sit in a code review. Uh, the next phase, so that, that was the, the code review phase. The next phase is the second phase is how to look at the application once it's gotten past that and into test environment. And this is about performance testing, running automated testing in this area, is the profiler. The profiler will do that for you, and again, very similar in the test environment, it'll do performance testing and it will send those findings and visualizations back to the developer so they get fast feedback, uh, they don't have to do anything yet. They're not creating performance tests, not doing anything. They're just kind of turning on the profile and it looks at the application and says, with a machine learning lens, I can see what this looks like. I'm going to run some tests that I assume will give you some feedback and pump that data back in. And then again, once it's promoted to production, you can continue to run the profile in production so that you get, let's say, you know, you assume you're going to get some performance increase, the test proves it and then you confirm it in production as well. So you've kind of got a full loop back, uh, full um, feedback loop. And finally, you know, that's really focused at the developer. There's nothing for operations yet. So AWS looked at that and thought, hey, we're doing all this stuff for the developer side of the process. What can we do for operations? And that's where DevOps Guru came to be. And we'll just talk a little bit, well actually, let's talk about this first. So DevOps Guru was developed, and the way it works is, it, you point it at a workload, and it'll, it start, it'll look at all the AWS resources in that workload, and it'll automatically decide what to monitor. The metrics, the automatic thresholds, all those things that you normally have to spend days and weeks and months, and actually, continuously you have to have someone looking at that permanently. This does it for you. And this provides insights to the operations team. So this is the, the service that's built around that. And the reason that I decided to talk about DevOps Guru and not Code Guru is because this looks at AWS resources, metrics, thresholds that we all have to look at if you run an AWS. Code Guru is really specific to a language. Right? It depends on what language you're writing, and currently, we're well supported in the Java space. Uh, Githka pointed out, I think, that there's also Python support, but I know that we're not very well supported across the board. So this may not apply to many use cases, but this applies to any resource you run in AWS. Well, not any, many resources that there is a, a window that it's currently supporting. I think it's, uh, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of the serverless resources, a lot of the EC2 types, all covered in this metrics driven. Okay, so, um, and the, the reason why this came to be, and why this is a problem, is because most organizations, small or large, started in this sort of way, where everything happened in one place, it was one piece of code, maybe, or, or a couple of pieces of code, it started over here on the left, and things were pretty simple, 
And then as you know, you take on cloud, you get multiple services, you, you want to take on different types of integrations, and before you know it, you've got very, very many complicated things to monitor. And yes, you've, you've gotten rid of heavy lifting because you're not running servers, you're not running storage, you're not doing those things. But now you're running complex operating uh, services, which are difficult to understand. And we'll get to some of the challenges later about why that's a big problem. And generally speaking, what ends up happening is you end up on the right with lots of dashboards, lots of metrics, lots of thresholds, lots of alerts, lots of warnings, and the bigger you are, the worse it gets. Okay, so the, the key challenges for operators today, again, this is a little bit more flat rep repetition from before. Usually there's huge amounts of data. If it's a big app, or even sometimes small, huge amounts of data, various different sources, different formats, um, you know, multiple dashboards. Uh, and when an issue occurs, what typically happens in a distributed environment these days is you'll trigger more than one alert but because something will fail and six things have now gone red and you have to go and investigate and you need an SME who understands each of those six things to figure out where that problem might be. And it's not, un that's not uncommon for a failure to require more room, you need to get people together and you kind of waste a lot of time that way. Uh, the other thing is it stops agility, right? Because no one wants new services now. They don't want another dashboard. They don't want to have to figure out what thresholds I need to set for alerts. And, you know, so it, it actually slows down agility a little bit. The more services you have, the less you can take on because your, your operations team is now inundated with, with more things to manage. So that's, that's a big problem. And I actually think that's one of the key reasons why this service is, is kind of interesting for me. Um, and we have, we're all sure, I mean, one of the other things which I hate, by the way, is, and I'm sure we've all been there, is when someone's misconfigured an alarm. So the first, the worst thing is, well, the second worst thing is, oh, don't worry about the red light. We know what that is, ignore it. It's not a problem, false positive, right? Just ignore it. And your dashboard's full of red. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it, it's all good. Even worse, when the dashboard's green and the machine and your system's down. And everyone goes, oh, we need to figure out what the threshold is. And we haven't done it correctly and we'll work on that and we'll fix it for next time. We need a post-mortem, we we'll to dive deep, figure it out, get four people together, by next sprint we'll fix that problem. That's even worse. And again, that's what DevOps Guru, hopefully, is designed to get rid of, right? Never have to worry about that again. Okay, so, machine learning powered service. So, you don't need to be a specialist in machine learning. All the models are trained through 20 years of experience of running and operating Amazon.com. So it's large scale, um, there's a lot of different sort of visibility, a lot of different workloads have been monitored to make these models. It's also been, it's not just Amazon.com, it's also done through operational best practices from AWS. So there's, there's a ton of data that's been feeding these models that's virtually impossible to create yourself. It's in fairness, that's almost impossible. Um, that's enough about that. So how do you enable it? This is, this is also interesting, is you just take a box and it's enabled, right? And um, you can, it's just how you scope it and what you want to see within the scope of DevOps Guru. You can say, just monitor my whole account and it will just monitor every resource in there. You can say, I, I want to monitor this particular CloudFormation stack. Just monitor that particular set of resources. Uh, or you can say, I just want to monitor this particular thing and give it a set of resources based on tag. You can do it that way as well. So it's very easy to turn on. Um, and the other thing is the dashboard's super simple, right? There's no gauges, there's no thresholds, there's no graphs heading to the moon, nothing. And the reason is that the, the thinking is, hey, we don't want you to look at the dashboard if it's green. We'll only let you know if something's going orange or red. So there's no... So, which is a bit unusual for most operators. It's very hard to look at a dashboard and go, oh, well, what am I looking at? Nothing to look at, everything's green, essentially. Right. If there's something there, it means we found something, the model is looking at, and, and the other interesting thing about this is, there's two types of insights that are generated. The first one is a um, reactive insight. So that means something's actually broken, and there's an actual failure, and now we're telling you this, you need to fix something, and it's reactive. 
and there's also the proactive insight, which says you're approaching a threshold and we think this is going to cause you a problem. So an example of a reactive, uh, sorry, a proactive one would be you've set your scalability threshold to 20 instances and you've been running for a year and you never thought you'd break that, so you set it to 20 a long time ago, and now you're approaching 20 and you're going to hit this threshold and your scalability metrics are going to max out. So or your over time your CPU's been moving up and now you're getting close to a threshold where you might want to think about scaling out. So those sorts of things where you normally would look at a graph and go, oh that's kind of getting to a point where I need to worry, Devil Screw will sort that out. And if something's failed, you'll definitely get a, a you know, something's broken. Um, the other thing which is interesting is the it provides prescriptive guidance. So it'll look at an, it'll look at a thing, say, hey, you know, you've I'm seeing a thing which is approaching a problem. And I won't just tell you that I've seen that, I'll also tell you what you might want to do to fix it, like increase your scalability uh, maximum or I don't know, change your thresholds for memory and footprint on Lambda or whatever it happens to be. Right, so it, it kind of gives you the actual actionable thing that you can do. So and the, the fundamental outcome should be a reduced MTTR for your and increased uptime in your application, which ultimately is what most people want. So when when you turn it on, does it start learning then or does it look back through your metrics? No, no, it can't so good question. Uh, actually one of the reasons why I didn't do a demo is it's actually quite tricky to demo because First of all, it has to learn, because what happens is when you enable it, it'll look at the resources you've got, and it will set a sensible default based on the machine learning models. But then it takes some time to look at the actual workload, and it will adjust the thresholds and metrics based on the workload that's running. And so that takes up to 24 hours. And then it will start providing you insights. So yeah, the, the reality is, yeah, you turn it on, you've got to wait a little while, and then it'll start providing some, some detail for you. Yeah, unfortunately you can't look back in history. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how it works. Again, so a little bit to build what you just said now. The, how it works today, this is an example of something you might monitor. So let's say this, been, this has been deployed by CloudFormation. It's a serverless application. It's got an API gateway, Lambda, and a DynamoDB. Hopefully everyone knows what those are. It's a database, serverless function, and an API gateway, entry point, serverless function. And what uh, DevOps Guru will do is it monitors the metrics from CloudWatch and CloudTrail, um, and if it sees an anomaly, what it will do is bundle those events together. So it will grab all the things from CloudTrail that relate, and it will put them into a bundle essentially and give you an insight. Say, because typically I don't know if anyone's had to do this, you you would have to do that yourself. You'd look at a CloudWatch log and you'd find a thing that was related, and then you might have to go to another log try to look at the same time and figure it out. This will put that all together and give you a bundle of information which is much more easy to diagnose a problem and hopefully identify the reports. Um, so this is the marketing slide, but basically what it's saying is, you know, no longer have to configure thresholds, which I think for me is awesome by the way. I never had to do that. And, and also getting it right is almost impossible. Even if you're really good at it, you can't really get it right. You may as well let a machine do it, to be honest. Um, reduce operational overhead just means you know, you're not spending your time doing that. And the, yeah, the proactive thing's really interesting. So you know, if something's working, and typically you go, great, my life's good. When it finally fails, it's usually because, and that, that's, a, that's a maturity thing, right? It's very rare that you get all your configuration correct to start. And as you scale, you normally find a few issues. Again, this hopefully is aimed at fixing that problem. You should pick up a few things that you hadn't thought about before they become a problem and you have to go diagnose it. Uh, I just stuck the slide in just a little bit because if you are a large organization and you have multiple account strategy, maybe using Control Tower, then you can centralize notifications from DevOps Guru into one location and you can either persist them or send them through email or whatever. You can so if you have a multiple account strategy which most customers do, then that's available to you as well, which I think is really useful. Um, okay, so here we go. Here's where the you know what services does it work with? It works with most of the 
observability for, um, services within AWS. X-Ray, um, you know, config. Uh, it definitely works with CloudWatch. Yeah, there it is. So basically, it integrates with a lot of the services and brings them all together in one place. And if if you if you have uh, if you're already using Systems Manager Off Center, it will surface those findings in there too, so that you can have it all in one place if it's something you do. Uh, and there's encryption used when you know for the actual data that's crunched to make sure that you know nothing's um, left without encryption. So references, these are the main. So what I've done is I've added. I'm not sure how we share content. But we'll figure that out. But basically, I put a link in there to all the customer use cases. They're all slightly different, but the outcome is reduced hours of downtime and, and, and improvement in MTTR. So, you know, the use cases are slightly different, but that's basically what they come out with. Oh, the other thing is there's integrations with third party, which I think is again kind of useful. So you can integrate with Atlassian, Opsgenie, or PagerDuty. And I've never seen Cloud Arc or Cardio. I'm not, I'm not sure how that works, but those two products definitely can be integrated. So there's third-party support for um, for DevOps Guru as well. Uh, free tier, and again, I've added the documentation links. There's some samples from um, how to get started with DevOps Guru. Um, there's a workshop as well, so I don't know if anyone's ever done an AWS workshop. There's a walkthrough of how to set up an environment trigger some events, wait for 24 hours, do all those things. And free tier, so 10,000 DevOps Guru API calls per month. You'd have to be pretty large actually to, I think, this is a typical AWS thing where, you know, first three months though, no, but you'd have to be pretty large to actually break that to get charged in your initial three months. So it's worth a try. Uh, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about. I'd be, I'd be interested to understand what you guys think about the concept of moving ML or pointing ML at this problem. I think it's actually very likely we're going to see more of that because who wants to configure metrics? And actually who wants to have to understand all the dashboards that you know you have to jump in and tweak that metric to give you that feedback in CloudWatch, then you go create a thing to go work out where the metric threshold should be and then you get the alert. Otherwise you will never know. Thoughts? Anyone? Is there any overlap with uh, AWS with data detection whatsoever? Like um, a machine learning algorithm figures out something's wrong with the workload since this change has happened? Yeah, so so actually one of the reasons why I didn't do a demo is okay. One of the reasons why I didn't do a demo is because um, if you if it's if it's monitoring certain things, one of the first things it thinks is a problem is actually a change, which is fair. So so if you if you deploy an application and then let's say it's running fine and you deploy a change and then you break it, the first thing it will recommend is, hey, you've just changed it, roll that back and you'll fix your problem. Right? Which is fair, but the problem is that makes it hard to demo because uh, the demo requirement recommendation most of the time is roll it back. Right? And so the, 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 it's, it's, it's an interesting, and if you think about it, that's actually correct. I broke it, right? I broke it and that's why it, sh it should be detecting that. So the real way to test it with a demo would actually be to set a threshold and then find a way to break the threshold in the demo. But, you know, I didn't spend long enough on the demo to, <laughs> to give it a go. But yeah, you're 100% right. So you, it will detect the drift. So if someone rolls out a change and that's the reason why it broke, it would recommend, hey, you need to probably roll that change back. And it, it does things like uh, database configuration. Um, you know, so if you change database configuration, it may warn you, hey, you've triggered a change, which is very likely going to cause you a problem. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you can actually choose the scope of what you yep. analyze. So in a production account, wouldn't you, as a best practice, just ask it, okay, go and analyze everything? Yeah, so the, the way it works, again, um, I guess it depends, right? Because if, if it, you may not want to monitor you may not want to know about, maybe if your production account is, if you're running an environment where you're running one app per account and you're comp compartmentalized like that in a drop down fashion, then yeah, probably true, you can just turn it on for the whole account. Uh, you don't get charged per resource for monitoring, by the way. 
So you can charge per application, which is also a bit of an unusual choice for chargeback. I'm, I'm a bit confused by that one because it means if you can wrap a lot of stuff into one app, it's cheaper than having multiple apps, which is a bit of a weird one. Um, but yeah, so yes, you, you could turn it on for the whole account, but it, it gives you that option. So you might want to do it by tag. Maybe you only care, like maybe there's some shared services running in your account that's managed by a central service and you don't want to see that in your DevOps Guru findings. So you might want to just say, this particular app is all I'm caring about. You can do it by cloud permission snack or tag or just limit it a little bit, which is probably what I imagine most customers would do. Okay, well, um, <coughs> sort of lumpy workloads where like billing places are built like some up their old customer base, you know, so we get reason to spike up like these spikes. Yeah, so um, I asked that question of the specialist who I was talking to about this, and he said that theoretically it should understand that. So what you might get is the first month it may warn you. It may warn you and say, finding you've got a spike in activity, maybe it's a denial of service attack. So it'll, it'll, uh, it might say, or maybe your user base is sort of a bit spiky. It might say, hey, you've got a denial of service attack possibility. But if it then saw that every month it bounced out, and then it, after about two or three months, you shouldn't get the money anymore. So that's the theory. I haven't seen that in practice, but yeah. What's the point? Looks like a really, really good service. I would definitely recommend my ops team to do it right. Yep. Uh, so for example, if you have a custom metric, which is like pretty specific, Yep. And, and, and you want your custom metric to be monitored by uh, the DevOps pro. So right. how would you do that? And do you have do you have to create your DevOps pro to look at that or just fix it, fix it up automatically? Mm. So I don't think you can add a custom metric at this time. So you right. would then be what you're doing is really saying I want to do manual monitoring. And you can still put a custom metric in, right. but you'll be monitoring it manually, not via DevOps Guru. So there's no way to sit, because I guess uh, those models are trained on, uh, you know, common metrics that are available. Um, but hey, you never know in the future, maybe that'll be an option. Yeah. Yeah. But right now. So you mentioned that uh, it can actually send notifications through SMS. Yeah, so uh, the reason I put that in is because the, the way it works is the, so the way it works is obviously you run DevOps Guru in each account, and you can it's got SNS integration where you can send the, the findings to a central account, and then you can do something with them, like I don't know, auto remediate, or you can we probably wouldn't want to remediate, but you can send emails or you can put them on a dashboard or, or do whatever you want over here. So all it's doing is that that just means that you don't have I don't know you don't have to look at your if you're in a large organization your hundred different accounts individually you can send it all. So if you wanted to fork out the notifications, let's say you can have two DevOps teams yep. with different geographies or something, yep. would you actually have to fork out something after the SMS or could you...? Uh, I'm sure that, that that would be doable because I guess you'd know the source, so you'd be able to do something. You could send a tag through or something right. that would allow you to say, this is team A, this is team B, and send it to different tags, different teams. Again, that's the reason why I put it in, because I think most organizations would end up with some sort of centralizing mechanism. So you could even send that to your on-premise monitoring dashboard or something at that point. So <coughs> when you say it reads the cloud formation stack, so that's basically just to identify the resources yep. and maybe their configuration to say just what's the most like and then what they're actually doing. And Correct. Whatever. And the, the other thing which is interesting is if it's in a cloud formation stack, and it's auto scanning, for example. All those additional resources will automatically be, you don't have to like go and add them in. They automatically encompass in that boundary. And so, which is also great. Meaning, you know, as it scales out, it gets monitored, as it scales back in, it comes out. It's pretty good. Yeah. So, so, so the resource is based on um, like some sort of tagging, just like, like for example, let's say if I have like 100 instances and I don't want those to be monitored yep. with the DevOps probe. So can I can I can I um, filter it to uh, let's say like ten based on get yeah. or anything? Yeah, you can. So right. the, the, like I said, the, the the way you can boundary it is quite flexible. So right. you can say I just want to do the whole account. Nice. That's option one, and that's actually really easy. You just literally go there, click tick, turned off, whole whole account done. 
Uh, you can do it by specific resource. You can say this particular name, EC2 instance, it's all I want to monitor. You can also do uh, tagging, so you can say find all the resources with this tag, find it in there, or you can point to a calculation stack. So quite, quite flexible. Um, probably covers most people, I think, in how to, to put the boundary. Maybe. Some of them might make the right Cool. Anything else? Let me know. If anyone uses it, let us know in the next AWS uh, meetup because it'd be cool to find out. Awesome. Cool. Thank you.